Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, warshippers of all ages, welcome back to YouTube. My name is Sea Raptor, and today we're going to continue our Learn to Play series with the Japanese Heavy Cruiser Line as we take a look at Tier 6's Alba. Alba's a ship that has undergone, well, a bit of a renaissance, I suppose, in the game, in my mind, right? When the game first released, the Tier 6 American Heavy Cruiser, well, American Cruiser, was Cleveland which absolutely blew everybody's mind because in no circumstances was Cleveland a mid-tier, you know, 1920s cruiser design the way Alba was. So comparing this thing to Cleveland was a disastrous misnomer. You couldn't, I mean, Cleveland just outclassed the ship in basically every rational, every meaningful way. But after the American heavy line was reorganized and uh, other cruiser lines started to come out, I feel like Alba got better over time. Certainly after she had more and more battleships to shoot at, certainly more and more softer battleships to shoot at. I'm looking at you, France and the UK. Um, this is a ship that in my mind still performs very well with the right matchmaking and can be highly effective if you play her in the right fashion, the right style. And we're going to talk more about that, I think, when we get to um, torpedo angles, I think is the right place to talk about it. Um, yeah, we'll save, we'll save that conversation when we start talking about torpedoes. But Alba, just kind of looking her over, you're going to see a ship that's going to remind you a lot of where you just came from, right? Furutaka laid out in a very similar fashion. Alba and her sister ship, uh, Kinugasa, were actually meant to be um, uh, follow-on, like, later ships in the Furutaka class. But the Furutaka hulls had a lot of problems, and they didn't even fix all of those in the Alba class ships. Um, but these ships grossed, uh, I think, a little, little over 8,000 tons, sounds about right. Um and they're a little, and we'll talk about this when we get to survivability. They 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 pay for it a little bit in the health pool, but the gun layout is very familiar, right? I've got I've got a two, couple super firing barrels up forward, one aft. Um, I'm gonna have a big citadel, and we'll get to all that in a minute. So yeah, if you've played, if you're coming, if you haven't skipped through Furutaka, many of the lessons you learned in Furutaka are gonna be applicable here in Alba, and I'm gonna try and help you learn some more that you're gonna need before you get to Miyoko, which in my mind, Miyoko is, oh, Miyoko is so good and so worth the effort, okay? So here we go, let's talk about Alba. So starting like we do with survivability, you see there, 31,900 hit points is, well, now remember, I'm gonna compare her to other heavy cruisers. Now, heavy cruisers in tier six is a larger pool than it was at tier five, but it's still not a very big pool, okay? So when you compare it to her to other heavy cruisers, this is really bad. It's worse than tier. Um, it's still behind Pensacola, which is not great, right? Um, the only other tech tree heavy, there are only four tech tree heavy cruisers. Well, five now with the Spanish, right, in tier six. That's Alba, Trento and for the Italians, Devonshire for the British, and Pensacola, of course, over in the American branch. Um, and of course, we've recently added, I think it's uh, Baleares in the Spanish line. So, you know, 35,000-ish hit points is about what you'd expect, and we're a little below that. Is it catastrophic? No. Will you feel it? Will you notice? You will. It's irritating. It's irritating. There, there are times you're just going to get slapped, like certain battleships in your matchmaking bracket, two citadels and you're out, right? It can absolutely happen to this ship. So you got to be very, very, very cautious and very, very careful. 4% torpedo protection is tied for worst in tier, right? We talked about it in the American videos. Um, it's bad. Don't run into torpedoes. In fact, I'm going to recommend you take hydro on the ship. We'll talk more about that later. But that's only one of the reasons I'm going to recommend you take hydro on this ship, okay? So this is something that is a weakness of the ship in this tier. And it does, in my opinion, impact how you play. There are things that you can get away with in a Miyoko, which kind of goes swings to the other end of the extreme. Miyoko is one of the... Uh, healthiest tier seven cruisers, but here at tier six, we're not there yet. And so you're on the low end of the health pool. You have to play maybe a little more cautiously and guard your health a little more jealously. Um, maneuverability and concealment, 36.8 knots with a speed flag. You're basically looking at 35 knots based on the surface. 17 on the turning circle, six and a half on the rudder shift is buffed. I think I'm running the rudder shift uh, module. We'll check that in a minute, but yeah, 35 knots is pretty good. Tied for best in tier with the Italians, right? This is plenty of speed for a mid-tier heavy cruiser. In fact, um, you're going to you're gonna be, you know, you're going to leave almost every other heavy cruiser uh, in your tier in the dust. The only person who can keep up with you, keep, can, uh, keep up with you is Trento. And it is really, really good because this ship wants, is going to need that ability, right? And we're gonna, again, we're going to talk more about that when we talk about how to play the ship. But just remember, the speed is an asset, okay? You're absolutely going to need that at times. 10.5 kilometers is a full stealth rig. You see there um, on the surface, that is not quite best in tier. 
Um, both of the British, that's Devonshire and her premium cousin, London, come in a little ahead of this, maybe about two to 300 meters ahead of this. And of course, um, Spanish premium uh, Canarias also comes in ahead of this as well. But it's still really good. Like you're not dealing with Pensacola's level of detection. Uh, you're not dealing with Trento level of detection, which is so nice because you need all the help you can get in a ship with this little health. So you are a little fragile in the survivability side of things, but you make up for it by being a little on the stealthy side, which is nice. It's very, very nice, uh, especially as narrow as a profile as this, as this ship has. Um, we didn't talk about armor. We'll take a quick step back. Just like we saw on Furutaka, I've got 48 millimeters of deck armor. So again, when you're fighting other heavy cruisers or you know other, other light cruisers, uh, HE shells that plunge in and hit your deck will shatter. They will not penetrate your deck. That is a bit of a nice advantage. It's not the kind of thing you can bank on, but it is something to keep in mind. Um, when you're engaging an opposing heavy cruiser. Uh, if they get case, they get shells into your casemate, those will absolutely penetrate. You're still stuck with 25 millimeters on the casemate. Um, and I think your belt armor, let's pull the torpedoes away, is the same, right? You're still looking at only 76 millimeters of, of, of armor across the belt. So you, you have an almost identical um, almost identical armor scheme to Furutaka. So a lot of similarities between the two ships, right? One change is the bow. You now have 16 millimeters of bow plating as opposed to 13 millimeters of bow plating. Now, functionally, this will make no difference to you because we talked, remember, if, we've, if you go back and you watch the Pensacola video, we talk about one of the ways that wargaming differentiates heavy cruisers and light cruisers is bow armor. In truth... That only applies to certain lines of ships, okay? The Japanese heavy cruisers are not afforded this uh, courtesy, buff, whatever phrase you want to throw at it, because they are highly capable ships and because of the torpedo loadouts. I really think that's what it is. I'm not sure if Wargaming has ever explicitly stated it that way, but I'm like 98% positive that the reason that the Japanese heavies never got the same bow armor buff that the American heavies did is because the Japanese ships have torpedoes and that makes them much deadlier if they can get into close range and deliver those. Whereas an American cruiser that's caught at mid to close range with a battleship has its guns. Like, that's all you got. So Wargaming was like, all right, so we'll give the Americans a little bit of a, a, little bit of a perk here. And of course, the Japanese don't get it. Have a quick look at the Citadel, just to have a peek, and you're going to see it's incredibly similar, as you would expect, to Furutaka's Citadel. The Citadel itself, huge, encompassing basically about half the overall length of the ship, basically starting here at the forward edge of the superstructure, all the way back to the aft catapult, just aft catapult, just forward of um, the stern turret here. So, yeah, if you're broadside to a battleship, this three inch, if you're broadside to a light cruiser, this three inches of plate is not going to do you much good. Um, you want to try and make your turns either when your opponents are reloading, when you're stealth and they can't see you, when you've got smoke, when you're confident you're not going to get shot at, whatever. Because if you show an opposing battleship this juicy target, he will absolutely take advantage of it and you will be smarting and it will not be fun. So don't do that, okay? Main battery. All right, we're going to spend a little time, more time talking about the main battery than we did on Furutaka because I hinted at it before, but I can I can demonstrate it better now that we're at a tier where there's more competition and I found the right tool to talk about dispersion ellipses and the Japanese improvements. So these are basically the same guns you had on Furutaka, right? We're 203 millimeter, 50 caliber guns, the super firing pair forward and the single turret aft. We talked about that. I'm on an 11 second reload now as opposed to a 15 second reload. Um, that we had down at uh, Tier 5. For heavy cruiser guns in this tier, that is best in tier, right? No other heavy cruiser in Tier 6 fires as quickly as you do. Here's the trick. They all have more guns, <laughs> right? Everybody else has at least eight barrels. You have six. Pensacola has ten. So... All the, all the other guys reload in eh, 13 to 15 seconds, right? And you get, you get a little benefit because you have fewer barrels. So... Is that a big deal? It, it can be in the right situation. Um, it means that, you know, especially with the, 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 ang you know, the ability to kind of go bow on, present a narrow target, and fire AP out of these barrels at the right time, it can be a big benefit because you're going to be able to put salvos out faster than an opposing heavy cruiser. Um, so if you end up in a duel with an opposing heavy cruiser, you know, again, depending on angles and which cruiser you're up against, I mean, that can be a notable difference. In my mind, it's, uh, and you'll see this in the gameplay that we're going to show you later, it's a bigger deal when hunting destroyers. I talked about this in Furutaka's video, right? And, and somebody kind of called me out on it in the comments. I basically said, look, the Japanese heavy cruisers are not really destroyer hunters. 
And he basically was like, well, now hold on a minute. Did you watch your own game? You murdered destroyers. And I'm like, yes, that's true. But when I say destroyer hunters, what I really mean is a ship that has the ability to push and detect and fire their main battery almost as quickly as that destroyer does in order to put them out, right? And you probably have six inch guns in order to keep up with those. You're basically a light cruiser. A light cruiser, in most cases, is a great destroyer hunter. A heavy cruiser tends to not be as effective at it because the reload punishes them a bit and their maneuverability is less and so on. But Alba here, with the 10-second reload, gets, can, can kind of swing both ways, let's say, right? The 10-second reload is not amazing, but it's better than most of her contemporaries. So if you find yourself in that situation, using, you know, going bow on into a smoke cloud with your hydro ticking is not necessarily... Uh, the death sentence that it would be in certain other ships. And so that's something you've got to kind of keep in mind. That 11-second reload definitely works in your favor. 14.9 on the range is about average, really. Most of the most of the heavy cruisers in this tier are in the 15-ish kilometer range, and you're right on the line with that, right? There's some that are shorter. The Brits, for example, uh, have a lot less range than you. Um, Pensacola has a little more. Uh, the Spanish and the Italians, actually the Spanish have a little less, the Italians have a little more, that kind of thing. But 15 kilometers is very functional. This is um, a full kilometer better than we got at Furutaka, I think at least a full kilometer better at Furutaka, and, uh, and you're definitely going to notice, notice an improvement here. Now, let's talk dispersion. I hinted at it when we talked about it in Furutaka, right? One of the perks you get as a Japanese heavy cruiser is that you get improved dispersion ellipses. But what does that actually mean? How do you quantify that, right? I want to be able to explain, like, in a percentage-wise. Like, Japanese cruisers are more consistent this way than that way, or the dispersion ellipses are 10% smaller or whatever. So, I found online, and I'll put a link down in the comments. You can you can go check this tool out yourself. I found a tool that helps kind of map out dispersion ellipses. And then I plugged in the other tier six tech tree heavy cruisers, Trento, Devonshire, and Pensacola to run a comparison. So let's step through these charts here for a minute, and I'll talk about what we're looking at. Okay, so a couple of notes as I put up this first chart. When you go pull this chart yourself on um, the ballistics tool, the chart will go all the way out to 26 kilometers. I have removed that portion of the chart because none of these guns actually fire out to 26 kilometers in World of Warships. They all stop around 15 and change, right? Technically, Trento goes further, but for the purposes of what I'm trying to demonstrate, I've shown you basically more or less uh, Alba's max range, and that will demonstrate what I'm trying to do. So you'll see that on all of these charts, right? The chart will look like it should keep going, and it does, but I've truncated it because past a certain point, the data is, isn't applicable. So it's showing you more than would more than the game, the game takes into account for. But what you're seeing here is you're seeing the horizontal dispersion um, uh, numbers achievable for each tier six heavy cruiser, right? And what you're looking at is that Pensacola, Trento, and Devonshire all have the exact same number. That's that top line that falls under the brown. The brown is Pensacola, but Trento and Devonshire are literally underneath it. Like the lines are all on top of each other. And that blue line, you see there right below it, that is Alba. And so what this basically boils down to is that at most ranges, Alba has approximately, I'm going to call it a little less than 10% better horizontal dispersion uh, than these other ships. Now, what does that mean? There are two, two dispersion numbers that the game calculates to generate the, your, the overall ellipse that the ship will fire into, you know, horizontal and vertical. If you imagine an ellipse on the water, the horizontal dispersion um, is the left to right, okay? So when I fire my guns at an opposing ship, the horizontal dispersion number um, is how far left or right those shells miss off of where I put my, my, uh, my aiming point, okay? The vertical dispersion is whether those shells fall short or go long. Okay, so this is basically telling me that Alba is more consistently going to group her shells towards the center of her aiming point, her ellipse, than the other ships in the tier. All right, that's good to know. Not surprising, really, but it's good to know. Now, let's have a look at the vertical dispersion chart, and you will see something very similar, right? Those lines all at the top, the brown is Pensacola, the green is Devonshire, the purple is magenta, whatever, is Trento, and that light blue line below it is Alba. Now, the vertical dispersion for Alba is significantly better than her contemporaries, out to about let's say about nine or 10 kilometers. After that, things start to get a lot more 
even, okay? So what does that mean? That means the closer in a target you're shooting at is, the more likely Alba is going to put those shells where you, where you aim them. The farther, uh, compared to her contemporaries, right? Farther away, they're all going to be relatively, relatively comparable, all right? And then when you try to kind of project all of this into one, um, one ellipse, you end up with a graph that looks something along like this, right? Which overall you see, this kind of takes into account, this is like merging both graphs together is the intention here, right? And so what you're getting is, uh, you can see there that Alba just overall, she is more accurate by roughly, again, depending on the range, I'm just going to average it out, call it about 10 to 10 ish percent um, out to about, looks like the gap starts to know right at around 12 kilometers or so. So, you know, her max range is 15. Out at that range, you're probably not going to notice a significant difference in the salvos you're firing against the, the, than, than, than the other uh, heavy cruisers in her tier. But the closer in she gets, you will absolutely notice Alba will put more shells on target. Absolutely. And it will notice. And, and if you go back and watch that for a talk video, that's kind of what you were seeing, right? That Farragut that I was shooting at, it was, he was at like eight kilometers or something. These curves for Furutaka look very, very, very similar. And so the gun performance is going to be very similar. And you're going to put, the game will allow, will occasionally just, when you pull the trigger, you will just roll the most amazing dispersion inside of 10 kilometers. And it just, it's like, oh, you're going to see one of those salvos in the sample game that I'm going to show you in a little bit. Okay, so yeah, a lot to like about these Japanese heavies main batteries. I'll show you the same curves for Miyoko just to kind of point out the trends, right? Not to belabor the point when we get there. But the bottom line is that the Japanese heavy cruisers, on average, I'd say roughly get about 10-ish percent better dispersion than the other heavy cruisers uh, that they are usually up against. Um, other than that, there's not much else to say about the main battery. The shells you're firing are the same, 3400 HE, 4700 on the AP, 11 second reload. Take advantage of it when you can. Torpedoes. Okay, now we have to have another, another conversation. All right. For starters, you have two launchers, just like you did on Furutaka. We've moved up to, I believe these, uh, I think Furutakas were triples. These are now quads. I forget if Furutaka had quads or not, but either way, these are quads. These torpedoes are a little slower. Uh, 59 knots here. I'm not running any kind of buffs for them, so that does kind of hurt them a smidge. 90 seconds on the reload is pretty solid. Can't really complain about that. What Alba suffers from is the same thing that Miyoko suffers from, is the same, same thing that Mogami suffers from. And so this is something that and you need to learn right now because you're going to be dealing with it for quite a bit of time as you play up the line. And that is the, the torpedo firing angles are terrible. For starters, I'll put the graph here up on Alba. You cannot fire torpedoes all, you can just barely fire them forward of a midships. I think it's like 84 degrees or something like that. The, the graph will have it here when you look at it. And then they only go back to about, about 40 degrees off the stern-ish, a little less than 40 degrees off the stern, something like that. So these torpedoes can really only be used when you are running away from something. If you try to charge an opposing ship and torpedo it with an Alba, you're going to end up probably dead because you're going to have to turn the entire hull of your ship broadside to whatever it is you're trying to torpedo. And a smart player, uh, uh, an experienced player, will know what you're about to do and will just wait for you to show him that giant citadel that we looked at earlier, right? And he will just wreck you. So, what that tends to then lead these ships into a playstyle of is what I call, what I'm going to call kiting. If you're familiar with the term from other MMOs, maybe World of Warcraft or something like that, what it's basically saying is I am running away from my target, I am actively moving away from it while firing back over my shoulder. So, Imagine then a world where Alba has an opposing battleship 14 kilometers away. The battleship doesn't know that she's there, but, but Alba is angled away from them. Imagine, imagine these buildings, this group of buildings in the background is kind of the general direction of my target. I'm looking over what would be my port, port aft quarter with my guns, okay? I'm putting six shells downrange every 11 seconds, and because I'm sailing away from him, my torpedo range is a little more a little longer, right? Ordinarily, you wouldn't, these torpedoes only have 10 kilometers of range. But if the guy is 12 kilometers away and sailing at me when I fire them, he's going to sail into their range when I try to, when I, when they actually, you know, actually get up to where he is. He's, in the time that my torpedoes travel 10 kilometers back towards him, he'll have traveled probably at least two kilometers towards me. And suddenly, those torpedoes might actually hit something. So, 
With Alba, you want to always be looking for an opportunity to angle the ship away from the opposing team and slowly, or sometimes quickly, we talked about her speed. Sometimes you really got to beat feet, right? You're going to crank it up the full and just go. But you want to be moving away from them, firing over one stern, one side of the stern or the other, and dumping the torpedoes back into their face. And then occasionally, when you get hit real bad, or when you've got to maneuver, when you've got to make a turn, you stop firing, you go dark because you have that great detection bubble, and then you can reposition, hopefully unseen, depending on the position of the opposing destroyers. These ships, uh, the Japanese heavies in general, are fabulous kiters, right? They are so, so good at it. The torpedoes are deadly. You have to constantly be on the lookout for them. They light fires regularly. Against an opposing, a, a well-played Japanese heavy cruiser against an opposing battleship, he will constantly be burning up his, D, his charges of damage control. You will constantly have him on fire. Maybe you'll get a double fire. Then he'll put it out. Then suddenly here come the torpedoes. Now he takes a flood. He has to live through the flood. Next thing he knows, he's on fire again. As a battleship player, it is incredibly infuriating to try to chase one of these things down when it's in the hands of somebody who understands what it's capable of. So, the torpedoes, the angles sound terrible, but if you play the ship in, I'm going to say, a specific manner, a particular way, you can absolutely use them to your advantage and get more use out of them than if you think of them as a, I'm going to charge up and get in your face and blow you away with them like you would in maybe a, a German cruiser, like a hipper or something, okay? Japanese heavy cruisers don't want to use their torpedoes that way. You want to be sailing away from the opponents, that kind of thing. Now, here's the trick. That generally means you want to try, if possible, and find yourself on the weak flank of, an, of, of a team in a random battle. And sometimes that's not always easy. Sometimes you find yourself on the strong flank and you kind of have to play the ship against its strengths, against type, as it were. Luckily, the guns and the main battery are good enough for you to do that. But when you find yourself in that situation, you're not going to get any use out of the torpedoes. You just aren't. Um, you're just going to have to accept that. And it's unfortunate, right? Because the Wargaming is quote-unquote charging you for them by not giving you that bow armor improvement that the Americans get. But in certain situations, you just you won't get any use out of the torpedoes and it can't be helped. So keep that in mind. But I think that's a really important lesson you should try and learn now in the middle tiers because you're absolutely going to need it when you play Miyoko and Mogami as you head up the line. Airstrike. Two charges, single bomb, not too shabby here. Um, you see that reload, I am running the captain skills that buff it and also the uh, the module that buffs it. So ordinarily, this is a 30 second reload time. You see there, I've got it down just a smidge under 20 seconds with all the other stuff that I've done to it. So yeah, I mean, hunting subs is not what you're great at, but as we saw in the Furutaka video, you can do it when you're forced into it. Uh, last but not least, AA, you're terrible at this. I mean, I'm just, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. You're terrible at this. Um, Furutaka was bad, Alba remains bad. You have a little, a very, very, very little bit of anti-aircraft fire in your outer bubble, which only goes out to 5.2 kilometers. Blech. Your inner bubble is okay, but like even a tier six aircraft carrier is a threat to you. A Ryujo is a threat to you. A Ranger is a threat to you. Any tier six aircraft carrier is a threat to you. And so when you find yourself in a game with a carrier, you need to keep your head on a swivel. Uh, a good or a, a, a heads-up carrier player will know how weak your AA is, and if you are caught in a position where he can take advantage of it, he'll take advantage of it, right? You have a fighter plane uh, off the back of the deck here, uh, off your catapult. This is not a spotter plane. This can never be a spotter plane. This will always be a fighter plane. Uh, it's not great. It's better than nothing, right? So save them for when you really think you're going to need it. That's all I can really say there. Let's talk about modules. Um, very much like for Ataka, you're going to take main armaments modification one here in slot number one. I like Hydro in slot two. If you don't have the coal for this, I would highly encourage you to take um, either one of these mods that, that feels good to you. Engine room protection is perfectly valid. Um, damage control modification, also perfectly valid. This buffs your reduction in flooding chance. How can you go wrong, right? Um, I do not, I would never, I, again, I talk about consumables, don't take defensive fire. Don't, don't invest in this on this ship, right? It's just not worth it. The Japanese cruisers, certainly at this stage of the tier, at uh, this stage of the branch, do not, it's not worth it. Don't do this. Um, you really want aiming systems in slot number uh, uh, three here, in my opinion. Again, you're only putting shells down range every 10 seconds. You absolutely want those shells to go where you aim them. Even though you have that improved dispersion ellipse uh, compared to all the other heavy cruisers, like, why would you not do this? Like, you want those shells on target. You're only getting to pull the trigger, you know, four or five times a minute. They need, you shells need to go where you put them. Now, if you choose you not to do this, main battery modification is a valid choice, right? That'll speed up your turret traverse just a little bit. That's not terrible. 
Do not do secondaries. The secondaries on the ship are not worth it. Again, we talked about how anemic the AA is. I, I, can, I strongly encourage you to avoid AA guns modification one. There is a case to be made for Torpedo 2's modification one, but I just don't feel like it. you'll get nearly as much value out of this module as you will out of this one. Aiming Systems 1, in my mind, is 100% the way to go. And then in slot four, which we didn't have at Furutaka, now we're getting slot four here as we get up to tier six, I have some choices, right? I'm not using steering gears, so this 6.5 actually is really good. Um, I don't think you need this. I, I, don't, I would not encourage you to take steering gears. Um, DCMS, uh, yeah, probably not, right? Like, ear heavy cruiser, you're going to push that repair party button almost any time you're on fire or flooding. Reducing those times is not really a good idea. It's just, it's not worth it. Um, propulsion modification, not bad. You could do worse. One of the things you're going to be doing as you kite um, is you're going to be trying to vary your speed. Not only will it hopefully throw off your opposing the opposing ships that are shooting at you, it will allow you to keep them in range. Because remember, you only have 15 kilometers of range to play with, and occasionally the something that you're shooting at is much slower than you. I'm looking at you, West Virginia or New Mexico, right? So you might, this, this, this module has value, but I still think your best pick as a heavy cruiser is airstrike modification one, right? Submarines, especially at tier six, are so common these days. When you find one, you need to be able to punish him as quickly as possible. This lets my airstrikes come back quick enough, and I think this is a great pickup. Um, consumables, you only get one choice. You get a choice for defensive fire and hydro in slot two. Please, 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 please take hydro. Please take hydro. Do not waste your time with the defensive fire on Alba. It's absolutely 100% not worth it. Um, flags, you can see what I'm running. I'm buffing my fire chances here with India X-Ray and Victor Lima. Um, Juliet Whiskey Uni 1 because, I mean, Japanese torpedoes have incredibly high flood chances already, but a little extra never hurt anybody. Um, I'm running Sierra Bravo because I'm getting a little more out of my hydro. I'm running November Foxtrot because I'm getting a little better a reload out of my consumables. Sierra Mike for some extra speed. And if you've got the Juliet Charlies, I'd say do it, right? Especially, to me, this is a, if you're just grinding out the ship with like regular economic bonuses, uh, this is debatable. But if you come over here and you put in like big blue or red econ bonuses, try not to detonate. <laughs> Spend the Juliet Charlies. It's 100% worth it. Commander skills, um, very similar to Furutaka here. You, you want Grease the Gears for turret traverse, in my opinion. You definitely want Gun Feeder. This is a, basically my, one of my default skills for like every heavy cruiser build I play. Um, Demolition, Demolition Expert, a great pickup at Tier 2. I like Fill the Tubes. Again, that little bit of extra torpedo reload. So when I put myself in the right position, I can maximize use of the torpedoes. As we mentioned, though, there are going to be games you're not going to get a lot of, get, not going to get a lot of use out of this skill. It is what it is. For only two points, though, I feel like it's pretty good. Um, priority target lets gives me a better sense of how bad it's going to be when I turn. In other words, how many people are shooting at me. Um, focus fire training is here, not really to buff the AA, more to buff the airstrike reload time, right? You see there that 10% helps quite a bit. This does give me a little bit of buff when I do push my sector reinforce on the AA. So for two points, this is kind of a dual skill. It's not too bad. Adrenaline rush here at tier three is an excellent choice. Um, I would not advise, I would advise against superintendent. You can make a case for a uh, survivability expert if you wanted to. This would be worth another, let's see, 900, 2700 HP. That would basically bring her up to very even with her cont contemporaries. She'd be around 34,000 and change. Um, not bad, not bad. But I, you know, for three points, it starts to feel a little expensive. You've got spare points, have that, right? Do you, do you. Um, concealment, you definitely want this. You definitely want this at tier four. And then other skills you might want to consider, um, again, like Furutaka, I think you can make a case for top grade gunner. I would not necessarily take outnumbered. You really don't want to be using this skill. Um, you don't need IFHE. I don't think RPF is a good pickup. Please don't sink anything into the A of this ship more than maybe focus fire training. Um, we talked a little bit about the tier three stuff. Um, you don't, you could, you could make a case for heavy HE, but then you're giving up some of your stealth and I don't like that. I don't think that's a good call. Enhanced Torpedo Explosive Charge, I mean, nah. I mean, if you've got the points, you want to try it, fine. But your guns are good enough that the, tor the torpedoes are, are a secondary bonus weapon for you. All right? The, the Japanese light cru cruiser line, in my opinion, has the opposite problem. They're torpedo cruisers with mediocre guns. The Japanese heavy cruisers are amazing heavy cruisers like re with really good guns and above average torpedoes. So in my mind, on a Japanese heavy cruiser, you want to lean into a gun build. And if any points you seek into the tor sink into the torpedoes are like a secondary thing. Um, you could make a case for consumables enhancements. If you've got a couple points to spend, you want to get a little more out of your hydro, that wouldn't be bad. Again, a little extra torpedo speed, swift fish, you've got a point laying around, this is not a bad skill. I wouldn't advise against this, you don't really care if your fighter comes back a little faster, you're not going to get a lot of use out of it anyway. Incoming fire alert, there's people who swear by this skill, if you like it, feel free. Last stand, same thing, 
Uh, it doesn't feel as critical on these ships as it does on, say, the German heavy cruisers. But uh, if you like it and you want it for one point, it's well, well worth it. You will get value out of it. All right. That is our tour of Alba. Let's go look at some gameplay, and I'll see you guys back here in a few minutes. All right, welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, to this sample Alba game here as we spawn into straight. This is really good matchmaking for us, with the possible exception of, well, there's a lot of opposing destroyers on the enemy team. Alba really wants to see oh, opposing success. cruisers. Like, that's... That's her bread and butter. She wants to be shooting at cruisers given the opportunity. This many destroyers makes a bit of a pickle, right? Her reload is better than Furutaka and better than Miyoko, her successor. So she is technically better at, you know, combating destroyers than either of those ships. But with a 10 second, or I guess it's 11 second reload, not going to be that great at it, right? It's not, it's not what you want to be focused on unless you're kind of pressed into it. Now, I'm going to pause real briefly. This game is going to develop very quickly as games on straight tend to. One of the reasons this map, I think, is so interesting and fun in the middle tiers is that usually from the time you spawn in and push go, you're shooting at enemy ships in 60 seconds or less. There are maps in this game you cannot say that about. Two brothers, anyone? And so this is a great example of how quickly a game will develop. I'm going to do something that I wouldn't ordinarily recommend. You see me here? I'm foot on the gas, right? Full speed, pushing up. I normally don't recommend this in a heavy cruiser. And if I'm truth be told, I'm not entirely positive why, why I did it in this instance. If you look at the minimap in the bottom right, you can tell that my detection bubble already extends to the opposite side of the sea cap. That's where the opposing destroyers are going to be. In a minute, my stealth, my, you know, above average stealth for the tier in a cruiser is going to be largely negated just because the size of the map means that I'm not going to get to play off of it very much. And so, ugh, right, like I'm, I'm perhaps making a bit of a mistake here. But I've got friends, right? That is the nice thing about this spawn. I'm not by myself. I've got destroyers. I've got a U-69 down to spot for me. Um, I've got two battleships on this flank at minimum and, and, and an Omaha. So... I have other potential targets. It's not guaranteed that I'm going to be the first thing the enemy team sees. So it's a risk, yes, but it's a calculated one. I'll say this. If you're still learning heavy cruisers or you're new to Alba and you're not confident in this ship, do not do this. <laughs> okay? Do not do this. What you want to be doing in a heavy cruiser, in my opinion, in most maps, you want to start off relatively slow, push up at half or three quarters, let the destroyers filter out in front of you um, at least four to five kilometers so that, that you're kind of in that, that, you know, that they get spotted before you do or they'll pick up the opposing destroyers before those destroyers know that you're there. That's really important in a Japanese cruiser, um, just because we, as we talked about all that, the talk about the dispersion ellipses, your HE can turn the tide of those destroyer engagements if you if you kind of get in there and use it. All right. So what I'm doing here is is risky, but I'm I'm doing it anyway. So you know your mileage may vary. Now pushing up very quickly, the first thing I come across is an enemy Pensacola. As an Alba, I am excited to see this guy. I have the AP loaded. I'm just waiting for him to turn, and you see there he's already kind of doing it. Yes, yes, little Pensacola, show me all your soft, juicy bits. And so now that he's, he's you know, obviously can spot me, but he turns back in, and I don't get a ton out of that salvo. I get some good full pins, though, four out of six on target. Now, I have to be very, very frosty of this guy. His AP will do horrible things to me if I allow it. But then this destroyer pops up, and suddenly, that is my new priority. Son of a gun. He is gone already. But you can see, I'm going to pause real briefly. Look at the turn that I've made, right? Yes, I pushed up, but at the first opportunity, I turned out. My guns are looking back over my shoulder. I'm kiting away. My guns can make this mover, and my torpedoes can potentially come to play because of this. This is what I'm talking about. This is the kind of play style you want to try to be focused on in Alba and certainly in Miyoko as we get up to Tier 7. So take the time and kind of... I won't say drill this into your brain because that's unfair, but get a comfortable and accustomed to and looking for opportunities to turn away from and the enemy team, whatever your target is, like shoot over your shoulder, fire your torpedoes back that way and either, you know, full speed kite away, half speed kite away, whatever it takes to, to land these shells uh, on target. Keep your guns in the fight, right? I'm vomiting the torpedoes out in the hope that I might catch this destroyer. I've got HE in the barrel, so I figure screw it. I'll put it at the Pensacola. The New York... Ow, lands a couple of full pins on my butt, which sucks. And now I can still see these destroyers. Now, 
I'm looking, I'm kind of vainly looking for a target. There are three different enemy destroyers up there in Smoke, or two destroyers in a submarine or something. So I'm just like, oh, I'm searching for a target, I'm searching for a target, I'm not coming up with anything. Because of all the smoke, I go dark briefly. Somebody then pops out, picks me up again. The Pensacola comes in with an AP salvo, but he's long. And now look where he, look where that guy is. He's broadside to me, and I happen to have AP in the barrel. Why, that feels good, doesn't it? Roll him, and, oh, feels bad. Three overpins. That's something that's going to happen a depressing amount when you fire at certain targets. I'm going to pause here again. Realize we're only two and a half minutes into this game. Look how fast and furious the action has been, right? So I'm going to have to pause a lot to kind of explain to you what's going on in my head while I'm doing it. Now, the Pitscola had an HE loaded. That's good for me. If he had an AP loaded in this turn, I would be in horrible shape right now. But he gets some HE shells to me. I take a little bit of chip damage, and I'll end up putting this fire out. In fact, you can already see damage control. I just pressed it as this next wave of shells comes in. What I'm looking for, again, is a target. That Pensacola has kind of rammed the rock. I can see him in the smoke. He thinks he might be hiding in there, but his smoke firing penalty is high enough that somebody is picking him up. Probably not me, but somebody is. And so I am going to get the AP back in the barrel as quick as I bloody can. Wait for my guns to get on target. No, I'm not putting the AP in. I have HE loaded. Oh, there we go. There's the AP. I think I realized I had HE loaded at the wrong second. And right as I draw a beat on him, the enemy Genova just comes sailing straight through the cap. So, sure. And there's my first Citadel of the game. Now, unfortunately, you saw there the dispersion wasn't quite what I wanted. I mean, that, that guy is, what, eight kilometers out. That should have been a good salvo. But I got a little hosed by vertical dispersion. And we talked about some of that earlier, the dispersion ellipses and and how that, that can, you know, kind of hurt you at, uh, at shorter ranges. Enemy Pensacola is reversing, but he's there. He's grinding to a stop. That means he's about to put his engines forward again. So I lead him in the superstructure and him get at least one citadel. But now here's the salvo I've come all this way to get. Okay, the Genova is angled slightly away from me, so I'm not aiming at his waterline. I'm aiming just above it because, again, he's pushing away from me. And look at this dispersion. Look at that. And wham! Four Citadels, 20,000 points of damage. That is what Alba is here for. Now, I'm trying to do the exact same thing to this Pensacola, but he pulls the handbrake and sort of jukes this shot on me. I get, like, an, some overpins up in the bow or something. And now, just like before, I'm trying to lead him. Is he going to turn the engines on? I bet that he's going to turn his engines on and try to juke me. Sure enough, he tries. Unfortunately for him, I gauged correctly. Three more Citadels and a dead Pensacola. Three and a half minutes into this game, nine Citadels and 55,000 points of damage. Alba has already fulfilled the duty that she does best, and that is murder enemy cruisers. In fact, look at the opposing team. Every dead ship they have is a cruiser. I am now, look at this. I want you to notice something. Look at this. We are three minutes and 40 seconds into this game. There are six dead ships, three on each team. I am the only surviving cruiser in the game. Cruiser is feast or famine, right? And there are times that even when you play smart, you are going to get smashed. It, it can happen. It can happen to the best of us. But you got to learn to play smarter so it happens less commonly. And Cruiser, in my mind, one of the reasons that I love the class is because a well-played Cruiser is, especially a heavy Cruiser, is so frustrating for the enemy team and so much fun to play. Oh, But I'm going to have more impact on this game because as the surviving Cruiser, I get to have fun. Now, this Durflinger and I are going to have a conversation that he's not going to enjoy very much, especially since... He is way out in front of the rest of his team, and I don't have anybody else to shoot at. I'm getting all kinds of good HE on this guy as I'm trolling at half speed. You see this? I'm kind of kiting away. I'm trolling at half speed. He's now flooding. He's burning. Now, he fired HE at me, and, well, that's an irritatingly good shot. I didn't expect him to land quite so much damage, and so I'm already down to about half HP. But it could have been worse. It could have been an AP salvo. And so now... Four minutes and change in, we've cleaned up their cruisers. We know the U-69 and two destroyers are up there. I still have the Gade and our submarine. And that New York is still back there. And I believe they've got a battleship around. Don't they have a Fuso? No. Okay, the Fuso is back on the 8 line. He's coming this way, but he's not here yet. He'll be relevant soon enough. So there's two destroyers pushing up on my Gade. I have to try and impact this fight. The Gade is... He ends up smoking, but unfortunately for him, he does it a little too late. 
He should have kind of done it as soon as he got lit just to try to preserve his ship. Unfortunately, it's going to come too late, and uh, we're going to lose him here in just a minute. I'm getting some salvos here. And the, the one thing that I'm a little nervous about... Now, let's, let's talk about this, right? I've talked about how the Japanese heavies are not really good at destroyer hunting, but you're going to see me do it here because it's we're, we're kind of pressed for it, right? My, my destroyer, the Gade, can't do it. The U-69 is not going to be able to get up here and kill two destroyers. Not an American and a, Japan, a Japanese one. They'll murder him with depth charges super quick. So I'm basically having to take some risks here that the New York's dispersion is either going to be bad or he's going to have HE loaded or something ridiculous... Uh, he's going to be looking somewhere else. Now, right now, as long as those destroyers are in smoke, they can't spot me. So that works for me. But as soon as one of them pops out, this New York is going to have good shots on me. And right there, you see it. The Shinonome, excuse me, the Hatsuharu comes out and is basically on top of my submarine. At this point, I'm trying to defend this sub as best I can. But as you see, my guns only reload every 11 seconds. There's only so much I can do. There's that closer in horizontal dispersion kind of, um, excuse me, vertical dispersion kind of hosing me here. But as he goes long, now the vertical dispersion plays a little bit in my favor. The U-69 does manage to get him. But unfortunately, my smoke balloon penalty means that this Farragut can see me despite the smoke. I've got plenty of hydro time, so all I got to do is get narrow just to give him a crap target and to give the battleships a crap target. Wait for my hydro to pick him up. Wait for my gun balloon dispersion to go away. And there we go. All right, so now if he hits me, he's guessing. Bingo. Right there, I've got him locked up on hydro at four kilometers. He's coming through me. He cannot see me through the smoke unless I fire my guns. As soon as I fire, those battleships behind him are going to know exactly where I am, and they're going to see me mid-turn. So I'm not going to shoot him instantly. I'm trying to escape this alive, right? So what I'm doing right now is I'm detecting him. I'm hoping that perhaps the West Virginia will shoot him. I'm trying to get angled away. I'm going to actually... I thought I actually, I, didn't, I was going to think about putting my own torpedoes out. But as I start to get angled away, he gets low enough that I can hit him with one salvo. And bam, just like that, I'm in and out. How did that work? He was the one detecting me. I murdered the ship detecting me. All of this smoke blocks the line of vision of that Fuso. He's going to catch one glimpse of me through that little gap right in front of me for like two seconds, three seconds. And then the smoke's going to pick it up again. And then whew, I'm gone. I get a little lucky with these smoke clouds, but there are times as a cruiser, you kind of got to learn to use them to your advantage and look for those kinds of opportunities. Now, there's still a Fuso in New York up here hunting me, and I want no part of that. This guy's going to get my torpedoes in the hope that he'll blunder into them. You should always be firing, right? We talked about this. Always firing the torpedoes every opportunity that you can. Now, that U-69 is also up here somewhere still. I don't know where he is precisely. That's not him detecting me. I'm getting lit on the surface by the Fuso, actually. He's inside my detection radius. And I'm going to try and just show this guy a crappy profile as I try to just beat feet and put some distance in between him and me. There's the ping from the U-69. So, obviously, we're going to at least try and hit him with some depth charges. Do our best here. I think I do clip him with one, maybe. I don't know precisely. I feel, I feel, I feel like, yeah, I feel like I clip him with one somewhere along the way. He takes a little bit of damage. No? No. Okay. Never mind. Awaiting instructions. Starboard torpedoes are available. Fuso's still coming, so let's give him, let's give him the business, as uh, my old buddy uh, Pigeon of War might have said back in the day. We'll uh, we'll try again with the depth charges. This is the one where I think I actually clip him with one. He takes a, he takes some splash out of this one. It's not a big hit, but Awaiting it's something. Instructions. When you're fighting cockroaches, you take every little thing you can get. There we go. And now, as I'm retreating, I'm probably just pushed out of range for those I'm not going to get much. It's going to be up to the West Virginia to possibly dump on him, presuming he continues to ping. There he is. Now, the U-69 here has screwed up by the numbers. He's caught on the surface in visual spotting distance of the West Virginia, who's now going to drop him, I think, with uh, certainly with the, the bombs, certainly with the main battery. He, yep, I get some main battery shells in. He gets some main battery shells in. My guns reload a little better. He tries to dive, but it's just not quick enough. And there we go. Take care of him with the guns. Now, I can't make that play, right? Because I can't take a hit from those battleships. I have to be back here where I am. The West Virginia is, or even the New Mexico just off my port side here, is the are the only ships that can potentially make that play for the team. Torpedoes to starboard. 
Now I'm out of, I'm just barely out of my detection range with this Fuso. If I fire right now, I'm showing him a stupidly good shot. But I can't turn to port because this New Mexico is right off, is right behind me. So as the Fuso moves behind the island, I'm gonna go ahead and take the risk and take some shots. Now I'm gonna pause here again. Let's let's assess kind of the strategic situation, right? We're down to three three ships, three friendly ships on this flank. Myself, the two battleships. The enemy team has about a 200 point lead, but we have a two ship lead. We have never owned a cap in this game, or at least it doesn't seem that, well, actually, I'm lying. It looks like we owned the northern cap for a while, but we certainly are about to lose control of it. And so things don't look all that amazing. We're about to pick up, I'm about to pick up another kill, right? This Fuso is going to go, I'm going to burn him down before those New Mexico shells arrive, just before. And, oh, hey, that's a Kraken. How about that? And so now I have a decision to make, all right? Player two has entered the chat as the Queen Elizabeth has now moved off the northern cap and come into the middle of the board. So now I've got two different battleships to shoot at. And as a, as a Japanese heavy cruiser, really, as any heavy cruiser, your priority target is almost always going to be the one with, le one with less health. And so you're going to see me spin my guns around, stay silent for a bit. I do not want to get spotted while I'm trying to get my guns, all of my guns, onto target for this Queen Elizabeth, as we have now lost complete control of the map. We have no, no incoming points at all. But as the QE starts to get a heal off, I realize, mm, you know what? I don't have time to wait. I need to get this guy on fire. I need to put some pressure on him. And so I'm just going to start dumping everything downrange. Now, I'm making an incredibly risky move here because I'm showing the New, Me the New York exactly the shot that he wants. Fortunately for me, he's looking at the West Virginia. Now, getting one fire on the Queen Elizabeth, I, you, can, you can see it's still ticking in there in the upper right. I'm like, okay, well, if I've got one fire on that guy, let's get another one going. And there we go. We get a fire going on the New York. Now, this is something that we haven't talked about much, but I want to point it out here. In a Japanese heavy, when you have opportunities like this to be spreading your fire between multiple battleships and not just, like, continually focusing one, sometimes that's the right play. In this instance, it's probably a bit of a mistake. I really should be focusing out the Queen Elizabeth. He's a lower. He just burned a heal, right? But having the opportunity there because I was trying to turn, my guns were already looking, it was like, eh, all right, fine, I'll take the salvo, but I really need to be focusing the QE. But back to the fire thing, right? Most battleship players, let me back that up, advanced battleship players, experienced battleship players, there we go, will generally let one fire burn. Japanese heavy cruisers get a tremendous amount of value and damage out of firing their HE and lighting fires on opposing battleships. If you focus out a battleship to the exclusion of everything else, and you, you know, he will you he will eventually reach a point where he's on he's on double fires, he will repair that. However, if you spread your love around a little bit and you're saying you're just out there to farm some damage, you you know, as soon as you get a fire on one battleship, let's say it's early in a game, you've got two or three different battleships you can be shooting at, you're happy with your angle, your good position. Once you get a fire on one battleship, look for somebody else to shoot at. Get a fire on that guy. If you can get multiple single fires burning on different battleships at different times, you will be shocked at how much damage you can rack up in a Japanese heavy cruiser. It is genuinely a hell of a lot of fun and incredibly infuriating for the opposing battleship players. But again, in this instance, I feel like it's a mistake. I probably need to be focusing on the Queen Elizabeth now that his heel is going down. This island between me and the New York is going to give me a little bit of cover. So we're going to come back to port, get my guns back on the QE in the middle of the board, who blessedly, again, is shooting at the West Virginia and not me. I'm trying to get my guns aligned here to get these shells down range. Just need to ding him a little bit. Oh, but the New Mexico takes care of it for me. And so now this New York that I've been evading and, you know, playing games with all game is the last surviving enemy ship on the team. Right as we get over the halfway mark. It's 10 minutes left in the game, but the game ain't going to take that long. So I lit this guy on fire. The fire's out. It hadn't didn't burn a full duration, so we know he repaired. So I need to be trying to focus on getting another one lit as best I can. Island's gonna kind of hose me here a little bit. I'm gonna have to wait till I get back to get back north just a smidge, and can wait for that little. There's the marker to go away. Check my range. Check my lead and pull the trigger. This is an instance where Alba, you know, having uh, four forward guns is pretty handy. There we go. Get a fire. Start ticking up some more damage there. Um, and, you know, I'm now down to a 9.6 second reload thanks to Adrenaline Rush. That feels really good. Like, I'll, I can I can absolutely get work out of these guns. And, of course, there's a high caliber to go with the Confederate as well. Just need a little more damage. He's stuck with that fire. But, again, the New Mexico comes in 
and seals the deal and takes care of it. So, yeah, all in all, a pretty quick game in Alba. Lots to absorb there, I think. So that's why I apologize if the, the pausing and restopping and starting was a bit confusing. But the game was so quick, I didn't really have time to, to talk about stuff without doing that. So, so anyways, let's have a quick look over, the, uh, over our results screens here. So, of course, topping out just a little over 100,000 damage are Kraken, 5 kills, High Caliber, and a Confederate. 8 fires, but really, really the thing that I'm most proud of there, guys, 9 Citadels. And you saw how quickly you can rack them up in this ship, in any Japanese heavy, really, when you're firing at the right ship that is making the mistake of showing you those uh, that, that, that right angle. The Japanese heavies have a different advantage than the American heavies, right? If you go back and watch the American heavy cruiser videos, what did we focus on? We focused on penetration angles. The American heavy cruisers get those improved ricochet angles. They are more likely to land full penetrations or citadels at steeper angles, okay? The Japanese have a different benefit. They don't get the improved ricochet angles, but they are more likely to have better dispersion to cluster more of those AP shells in a smaller area for big AP Citadel salvos in, in one go of it, right? And, and you saw that here in Alba with that salvo that just decimated the opposing Genova. 2400 base experience, well, 23 and change, really. Can't complain about this. Again, really good matchmaking for us. We were able to take advantage of it. One of the things that I will point out, um, Alba, and, and this is true of all tier six ships, but I'll say it just so that you don't think I didn't, I, I didn't forget, right? Alba really suffers when she gets tier eight matchmaking. That's not to say that she's useless or that she can't be effective. She can, but she doesn't up tier very well. This is a problem you're not going to have at tier seven. So be glad. But for now here at tier six, you're going to have to suffer it a little bit. It's not, again, it's not as big a problem at Tier 5 with Furutaka, and it's certainly not a problem at Tier 7 with Miyoko, but here with Alba, it definitely is something you're going to struggle with. When you're Tier, if you're in a 5, 6, 7 game, you'll be fine. But as soon as you get up tier to Tier 8, you will absolutely notice a difference. You will struggle harder, because now some of those amazing Tier 8 heavy cruisers are in place. Some of those guys have heals. Some of those guys have better detection than you. I'm looking at you, Baltimore. It will really feel bad. So you have to play a Tier 8 game, I think, much more conservatively um, than you saw me play here. In a Tier 6 game, I got a little aggressive, and it kind of worked, right? But you can see here the spread of damage, and this is something that we didn't really touch on in the Furutake game. I didn't get much opportunity to flex Furutake's AP in the sample game we had down in that video. Here, of course, basically, I'm almost exactly split down the middle. About half of my damage out of the AP, and by the time you count the fires, about half of my damage out of the HE. That's a really good balance for a Japanese heavy cruiser. It's, it's good to see, right? It means that you fired the right ammunition at the right things at the right time, in my view. Um, the one thing that would have been nice, more torpedo hits. But honestly, with the Japanese cruiser torpedoes, you can be smart about where you fire them, but opposing teams, opponents that blunder into them is really kind of out of your control. So you can't really, you can't bank on that, right? You're going to fire them, but it, it's, it's almost like spray and pray. It's like, well, they're really good at what they do. But hopefully somebody wanders into one. All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. There you go. There is our Learn to Play look at Tier 6 Japanese Heavy Cruiser Alba. I hope you learned something. I hope it was helpful. I'm really enjoying making these. This is a, ship, a line of ships that I've loved for a long time. I cannot wait to do Miyoko. That is one of my favorite Tier 7 Heavy Cruisers, and that'll be coming up in the next video very soon. So I hope to see you then. You guys take care. Wash your hands. Be safe. I'll catch you next time.